thoughts were given at Clyde Bank to conquest of the air or space by the great crowd of nearly 50,000 at John Brown's shipyard. Dominating the scene, the Q4, culmination of an immense team effort by designers and builders. Welcome back to Shipfaced, everybody. This is Season 9, featuring RMS Queen Elizabeth II. For this spectacular model of Queen Elizabeth II, and for other ship models, head to the Facebook model company Yester Toys via the link in my description. Designing what would become Queen Elizabeth II was a long, arduous process, and many design iterations, as you can see here, were considered. The final design, however, was a combination of retro space age design, as well as the look, depending on the angle of approach, of a yacht. QE2 was supposed to be the liner for the 60s in the space age. With growing numbers of passengers choosing jetliners over ocean liners, Cunard wanted to break, break free of their past, in some ways, in designing QE2 to look futuristic. The final design for the hull and superstructure was unveiled at a ceremony in the early 1960s. There were audible gasps in the room with how modern the liner looked compared to previous ships. Excitement and passion for the ship had already begun. On July 5th, 1965, the keel was laid for the Queen Elizabeth II, although at this time she was referred only to as the Q4. Construction for the Q4 began in John Brown and Company Limited in Glasgow, Scotland, on the Clyde. A staggering majority of Cunard's fleet had been built by John Brown and Company, so it was no surprise that that shipyard won the contract. The Scots, being very passionate people about shipbuilding, knew that this would be one of the last vessels their company would ever build, so the shipyard workers literally took their time constructing the liner, trying to spend as much time as they can on this job. I've read some personal accounts from surviving shipyard workers who would actually cut portions of carpeting and, and other textiles out of the materials to save for themselves, knowing that one day the ship would likely be very famous and that would be worth a lot of money. But despite delays and continued pressure from Cunard to continue progress, the ship did make progress and eventually it was ready to be launched. QE2 was by no means the largest ship in the world nor was she the largest passenger liner that Cunard had themselves owned in their fleet in their history. But she was what everyone felt like the last of the thoroughbred ocean greyhounds. I've also read that many, not all, but many Scottish shipyard workers chose to do work on QE2 without a salary because they knew the company was folding soon and also believed in the, in the project in the ship's future. The company was so impressed that they, of course, by the end, did pay them a prorated rate. But the idea that so many workers were willing to not take a salary proved the importance and the passion that everybody believed the ship already had. As if that wasn't unexpected enough, unexpected events were in no short supply with QE2's birth, and when Cunard invited and accepted Queen Elizabeth II, to be the godmother and name the ship at the ceremony, she had a twist of her own. The queen was requested to name the vessel Queen Elizabeth. However, when the day finally came, she smirked at the chairman of Cunard and said, Name this ship Queen Elizabeth II.
may have taken longer to build QE2 than previous ships in John Brown's history, but I think the Queen of England speaks for us all when she watched the ship slide down the slipway, looked at the beautiful liner, and said to her son, smiling, isn't she beautiful? After the royal event, where 50,000 people gathered to watch the ship be launched, QE2 moved into the fitting out basin to continue work on the interiors and the engines. Alright everybody, thank you so much for joining us today, and stay tuned for the next episode in Queen Elizabeth II's story. Thanks, hope you enjoyed, like and subscribe.